Rovers, and welcome to the World Service Project Tour Diary. It's a very, very surreal time to be touring and to be organising. Hi, I'm Megan Rowe. And I'm John Pope. And welcome to Jazz North Online. News, happenings, everything about music in the North you need to know. By the way, you are listening to the excellent Kenny Higgins here playing a solo bass composition, Midnight Waltz, for us to kick off the show. So last time we brought you updates from Leeds Jazz, the Lescar, Hull Jazz and a whole bunch of other promoters but since then things have definitely changed. All of these promoters and many others are having to change plans and react quickly to cancellations, necessary cancellations in the face of the new restrictions under lockdown too. Um, check out their websites for more information because they can tell you quicker than we can what their response to the developing situation is. Some places are maintaining optimism and are planning to put gigs on in 2021 or potentially even closer in December, such as Wakefield Jazz that we'll hear a little bit more about later. There has been good news. The Cultural Recovery Fund has awarded £59 million to Northern Arts organisations, including £14 million to directly support 95 different music organisations, including Brighter Sound, Manchester Jazz Festival, Leeds Hyde Park Book Club and Seven Arts. Also, Manchester promoters NQ Jazz are amongst the winners of the Arts Council's Grassroots Live Music Award. This funding is going to help organisers Kyron Matthews and Emily Burkett prepare a fantastic programme for next year in partnership with Manchester venues like Stollers Hall and The Yard. We're very sad to hear of the passing of Alec Sykes, who founded Wakefield Jazz in 1987. We asked musician Rory Ingham, who grew up in Wakefield and was taken to the club by his parents as a child to record a tribute for us. Now, when I was going to Wakefield Jazz, Alec was had given up his position to Chris de Saram. Um, however, it's the thing that Alec founded that served me so well as a young um, as a young kind of budding musician and in fact before that before I was interested in becoming a jazz musician I was going down every week my parents were musicians so it encouraged me to do that and I saw the likes of Alan Barnes, Mark Nightingale, um, Dennis Rollins, Nicky Isles, Mike Walker, Ian Dixon, them, some amazing musicians that um, have inspired me to play so ultimately, Wakefield Jazz, because of Alec and Faith who set this up, has has been such an amazing thing for Wakefield, Yorkshire, the UK, um, culturally, uh, to have. It's one of the most thriving jazz clubs still in in the UK and one of my favourite places. Um, I've played around Europe and, and Wakefield is um, one of my favourite places. The community spirit there is amazing and that's really what is such a great thing about this club not only does it start is a club a platform for listening uh, to great jazz and performing there um, to an appreciative audience but it's this spirit that's there um, as a place to connect with people in the community uh, over a love of jazz and, um, and have a good time and so we have a lot to thank Alec for um, he was very um, he was a great man and he will be sorely missed.
We've got music coming up at the end of the show from Leeds Northern Line band Sogo Rock. They've met the challenge from microphone manufacturers Aston to record an entire track just using their stealth microphones. Hang around to the end of the programme and you can watch their video that they produced in partnership with Leeds Conservatoire. We caught up with keyboardist Bella Hovath to find out about their upcoming album and what they've been doing as he was taking his driving test in Budapest. So here's that. Leeds College of Music, I love this place. They so much help for the band, so much possibility. Uh, Chagar Bupinda, he, he helped for the this video. Uh, because he contact with the Aston mic and uh, he sent uh, maybe four or five video and they choose this band. I'll be back in the UK a few days and uh, we are sounding cool now at the moment. Yeah, if you want a live stream or something, let's do it. Watch the sky, it looks so bright, the stars will sing for us tonight. BAPAM, the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine, have a number of online events available for free in the next few weeks. We'll be hearing more about these later in our chat with the wonderful Dr Mel Grundy from Help Musicians UK. We'll also be hearing from Dr Declan Costello about his part in England Public Health's study into virus transmission and live music. So both Declan and Mel are also practicing musicians as well as doctors, so they're bringing medicine and music together for us. But now we're going to meet a brand new member of the Jazz North team. Northern Line Programme Director Lucy Woolley moved from her seven year position with us in October. We wish her well in the next step of her career and we're very excited to announce the new Programme Director for our flagship initiative, Heather Spencer. We've grabbed a few minutes of her time to let her introduce herself. Let's check it out. Uh, my name's Heather Spencer. Um, before this position, I have been a promoter for about the last three years. Um, so I am the co-director of Durham Jazz Festival. Um, and I also was jazz development coordinator at Sage Gateshead, so I'm based in the Northeast and have been promoting jazz for a while. I first came into contact with Jazz North through, um, well, Lucy actually got in touch um, with Nick, who I do, Nick Malian, who I do the jazz festival with, um, and said, hi, <laughs> we're Jazz North kind of things, because we, I was at uni at the time, um, and Lucy invited me to come down to the, to, I think, JPN, I think it was a JPN meeting or something along those lines, and kind of that was kind of the first time I started to kind of learn about the industry as a wider thing, and I met some really interesting people there. Um, I knew about Jazz North when we booked some of the Jazz North bands for the festival, and then they were like, oh, here's this subsidy scheme, which was amazing. Um, yeah, so it was kind of that kind of last year of uni, just entering the working world kind of time. Yeah, and Lucy Woolley, who was in this role before me, and is amazing, like a kind of really helped me find, find my feet and meet some people. And from there, I went to volunteer on actually at Manchester Jazz Festival because I met Steve Mead there. And it, yeah, just kind of all kind of built from there, really. Heather will be hosting Zoom drop in sessions for artists and promoters to keep everyone in touch. You can email her at heather at jazznorth.org or follow Jazz North to stay in the loop about the sessions and get involved with the conversation. Northern musicians Ben Powling and Luke Redden-Williams, who are both members of the Excellent World Service Project, have sent us a video diary of their experiences in Italy, touring around Europe during the pandemic. Let's check it out. Hello Jazz North viewers, and welcome to the World Service Project Tour Diary. Very, very surreal time to be touring and to be organising. It's been fantastic so far. It's great to be here. We're, we have a great passion for Italy. I especially have a great passion for Italy. 
and last night's gig was very nice and tonight we're looking forward to it as well. Some air. Uh, dirty gross masks, yes. coming in in Italy. We've had a couple of shows cancelled. Um, we're hunkering down in Rome uh, and that's given us time to come to Villa Adriana which is Emperor Hadrian's little uh, pied a terre in the hills outside Rome. It's pretty amazing uh, but we're still going to be doing teaching some workshops in Rome uh, and live streaming a show before we head on to Germany, fingers crossed, next week. Hard times, but there's definitely an upside to getting stranded in Italy. Look at that view! Well, the next piece is a little bit closer to home. Congleton Jazz and Blues Festival got in touch via news at jazznorth.org to tell us about a documentary covering the last three years of activity they've produced. We've got a cup of it here and you can find the whole thing in the links in this video description. Yes, and don't forget you can also follow us and leave a comment if you've got anything that you think we should check out or that we need to shout about. But let's have a look at Congleton now. Give it a big Jazz and Blues Festival warm welcome, a big hand for Crybaby and the <laughs> Over ten years ago, a small idea began its journey. And today, we know it as Congleton Jazz and Blues Festival. For over a decade, this date has been marked. August Bank Holiday. Congleton Jazz and Blues Festival. It isn't really about music. Music is a facilitator, but it's about small town sustainability and raising community spirit. Every band is amazing. You're not going to miss out on anything. For me, I would always describe the ethos of the festival being about the, the town, bringing the town together. Today, the festival is organised by a small team, headed by Vince Cutcliffe. Bands love playing at Congleton because the audiences are great, the people that come along and see them are great. Heidi Brown, she's fantastic. And it's really important, actually, for people like Heidi Brown to come along. It's really important to have that musical diversity, but performance diversity. John, we've both been talking to doctors, haven't we? Mm -hmm. John spoke to Declan Costello to find out the facts about virus transmission and learn about the study he devised. Yes, it was super interesting. And Megan sat down with Dr. Melanie Grundy from Help Musicians UK to speak about well-being, mental health for performers and musicians and the support that they can access from the sector. Here's some of the things that we learned from talking to these experts in music and medicine. Today, I am here with Dr. Melanie Grundy, who is a BAPAM registered GP, a trustee of Help Musicians UK, and a secretary of Jazz North East. It's very nice to be back for a bit of a follow-up chat, Megan. <laughs> so Help Musicians UK is the leading music charity in the UK. 
and I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you what specifically has HMUK been doing to support musicians throughout this time? Our musicians were really quick off the mark at the very start of the whole lockdown situation. I think within within a month or so of um, the start of lockdown, they launched their um, hardship fund phase one, which was a scheme whereby um, musicians adversely financially affected uh, by lockdown, and cessation of live music performance and so on, um, could access a one-off payment of £500 um, to help support with um, necessary expenses like rent, like paying bills, etc. Um, and that was offered to nearly, nearly 16,700 musicians. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. So I believe... Um, now I can't remember the amount the amount of money, but basically five hundred pounds times sixteen thousand seven hundred, um, wow. and a lot of that came from help musicians own reserves, and a lot of that came from um, external donations as well. Wow. So a lot of um, other music industry organisations um, gave donations um, to be distributed by help musicians as part of that um, fund. So. That um, phase one of funding came to an end in June, I think it was, um, and then phase two got underway. And this was um, with the aim of supporting musicians who were either in the process of applying for universal credit, but still haven't received a payment, mm -hmm. or musicians who uh, were maybe fell between the cracks of universal credit and being eligible to apply for the self-employed income support scheme. Right. So, um, you know, maybe their, their earnings were too low um, or their earnings were, were over threshold or just for people who fell in the, into, into the kind of gray area between different types of government funding. Okay. So, um, and um, you could also apply to that fund if you were in, in, in crisis. It was also used as a form of crisis funding as well. And it will be replaced by hardship funding phase three, which hasn't yet been launched. So um, basically it's for people to kind of keep an eye on help musicians, um, social media streaming, um, because yeah. the, launch of, the launch of phase three will be coming very soon. Um, another really, really useful resource um, to keep you up to date with um, funding opportunities from help musicians and from other funding providers is the Corona Musicians Info page, which has all sorts of resources on it. I will load that up now. Can you see yeah. that? It's basically a, a one-stop shop in terms of advice around um, current government advice around um, you know what to do for financial assistance, what to do for health assistance. So there's links on there to to, to BAPAM as well, British Association of Performing Arts Medicine. If you um, if you have any health concerns, so basically that one resource contains loads and loads of links to various sources of help and information. Wow. So it's a really, really useful page. Very thorough, isn't it? So there is and the help out there for any. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. I know the situation seems can seem pretty bleak at the moment, um, but there, there are uh, is help out there. And also to remember that you know, while live music isn't happening, you know, people st still want to. Um, to, to keep working, to, to keep the kind of creative juices flowing, to keep ideas uh, coming. Um, and so that, um, that resource that you just showed also contains creative funding opportunities. Um, and um, there's some resources available via the BAPAM website about people who might be struggling with creativity and with, with keeping, keeping those ideas coming under the current circumstances because it, it can be really difficult to keep yeah. practicing and to keep writing and to feel inspired in the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some really, really useful resources. The BAPAM website has recently been redesigned. It's all singing, all dancing. Um, oh, and wow. um, if you go to the news tab on the BAPAM website, Performing, Health, Performing Arts Health News, there are some really useful um, links on this blog page. So if you go up a bit, Megan, mm -hmm. um, if you go up, so one, one useful one is on the top row there in the middle. Um, this, if you go down a bit, so creativity and motivation. So under, under that blog page, there's some really great information 
um, about how to keep yourself um, motivated and to maintain your creativity under the current circumstances. If you go to that news page, all those kind of subheadings there, all really, really useful information. Also, on the um, there's another tab on, on that page called training. I think it's the training tab. So training and events. And then if you go healthy practice training for creative professionals. <clears throat> so under that, what you will see is a grid of all the um, uh, healthy practice training events oh, wow. that are coming up. So these are free events. They're, they're held as webinars. Um, so, and they cover that there are sort of three main areas that are covered and they kind of cycle around these three, three main areas. So each month there is a presentation on vocal health, a presentation on mental health and well-being, um, and, um, a presentation on physical health and injury prevention for, for each of those three categories. They've got kind of three clinicians who take turns. So I'm doing the, the mental health and well-being webinar every three months. So I've just done one in September. So um, different people are coming up in October and November. Um, oh, yeah, they're really, really useful. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's great. I think we'll have to get these linked on, on the Jazz North page and definitely links will be below. The yeah. Videos. And the, the most important thing, the most important thing for people to remember at the moment when everybody's struggling financially is that these resources are all free. So these are, you, these are events that you have to, you have to sign up for through an Eventbrite page mm -hmm. um, in order to register your email so you can get sent a Zoom link to join, but it's completely free. That's so. awesome. My name is Declan Costello. I am an ear, nose and throat surgeon and I specialise in voice disorders. Uh, I spend quite a lot of my time treating singers, actors and other professional voice users, including teachers and various others. Um, and I'm also a singer myself. I studied music before I studied medicine. So I did a three year music degree and then studied medicine after that. Um, and in recent months, I've been involved in research about aerosols and singing. And when you got through this collation process and came to the results of the study, uh, were they a surprise? Did they line up with the projections that you had in mind before? I mean, what, what was the kind of, what's the key thing to take away from the study? For, for you from this data? From a scientific point of view, we went into this with, a, with completely open minds. We didn't have any fixed ideas as to what was going to happen. The research was um, uh, overseen by Public Health England and by the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. So it was all entirely above board. It went through ethical approval and we had funding from the government as well. So any, any findings that we came out with were very objective and, and very uh, thoroughly looked at. Um, the headline figures were um, that quiet singing or quiet speaking produces a modest amount of aerosol. Loud singing or loud speaking produces 20 to 30 times as much aerosol. So the difference in the amount of aerosol produced between quiet and loud speaking or singing is huge. Um, and that's similar, you know, from quiet speaking to loud speaking, from quiet singing to loud singing, the difference is about 20 to 30 fold between those two. Now, the question then is, is singing any more aerosol generating than speaking or shouting at high volume? Well, yes, there is more aerosol produced in singing than in shouting, but uh, only a factor of two or three fold. So that difference between loud speaking and loud singing um, is a relatively minor difference when you compare it to the huge difference you see between very quiet vocalization and very loud vocalization. And in relation to instrumentalists and wind instruments, brass instruments, um, does the same sort of curve apply there or is there a significant difference if there's an instrument involved? Well, we at the same time or in the same batch of experiments, we did collect data on wind and brass instruments. Now, the pressure to get the uh, information analysed for the singers was huge and actually the government pushed very, very hard to get those data out very quickly. The information on the wind and brass is still actually in the process of being analysed and we're hoping to get those out in the next few weeks, but there are a few other sort of uh, hurdles to get through and the data for those is quite complicated, so we don't have those results just yet. Right, okay. I mean, it's, I guess it's worth saying also that um, we have been giving uh, the government uh, the, the, the data, the sort of preliminary data as it's coming through. And it's worth saying that in the middle of August, 
uh, the government opened up performing, whereas previously there was no singing and no wind and brass playing allowed at all. On the basis of our data, things opened up and singing was permitted within social distancing guidelines. Um, and the same was true of wind and brass as well. So um, it's been good to see venues and, and performance spaces opening up again. In terms of our involvement with venues, how do, how do the findings that, that your study has brought out um, impact the measures and the restrictions that venues are adapting in order to stage performances? And how can we as musicians best adapt our practice to stay safe and be part of that? Uh, th there are a number of different mitigations that people can put in place to try to uh, make performing as safe as it possibly can be. But it's worth bearing in mind now that we're in an era where there is no such thing as absolute safety anymore. You know, if you go to the shops, there is a degree of risk. If you go to a restaurant, there's a degree of risk. And we're, we're all in a place now where we're going to have to manage the risk as best we can. Um, but thinking about how performance can be made as safe as possible, there are a number of different areas to think about. I mean, the first thing is about the location where you perform. Clearly, in a small space, um, there is uh, the, the amount, the aerosol that you produce is going to be much more concentrated in that small space, and the concentration of aerosol is going to be much higher. So, where, so whereas if you're outside, ideally, or if you're in a huge cathedral or something like that, then there is much more space into which the, um, the aerosol can dissipate. There's been a lot of talk about ventilation over the last few weeks as well. Ventilation is clearly going to be very important in the coming weeks and months and years for that matter. Um, and at its very simplest, that might involve opening a window at one end of the room and opening a door at the other end and just allowing a very steady through flow of air. Not mm. a particularly attractive prospect in the middle of winter, <laughs> in, uh, I have to say, but uh, it's certainly an option. And I think as time goes on, ventilation solutions will become quite sophisticated and uh, the ventilation engineers will deal with this. Um, the third thing to think about is the number of participants. You know, if you've got lots of people on stage, they're clearly going to be generating, you know, you've got 20 people on stage, they're going to be generating 20 times as much aerosol as one person on stage. So managing the number of participants, I think, is going to be important as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and then think about the audience as well. If you've, it's all very well having two or three people on stage, but if you've got 300 people in the audience, even as they just breathe, they're going to be generating aerosol too. So there's, there's a lot of different ways in which we can try to mitigate the risk. Um, and uh, you, the wearing of masks has been suggested as well. Um, but you know, that's a whole other, a whole other area. Well, up next, we have a discussion panel about live streaming. I sat down with a group of musicians, promoters and educators about the future of live streaming and the effect it is having on the music industry. Awesome. Let's have a look at that. Because I write contemporary classical music, whatever that means. Sometimes, you know, you write music and it's done in a concert with some people and there's an audience and there's, you know, there's 10 people maximum. Um, and, and then actually having things live streamed, which has happened a lot more frequently during this lockdown, I've got much bigger audiences as a result. Wow. So, um, so for me, for that side of what I do, like kind of, I have more interactions rather than, rather than less, I think. It's okay maybe for soloists to make things happen, but like there's a lot of us all in bands here and like you, like you say we're all in different cities yeah. so unless you can get in the same room together you can't really make it work sound wise and even then like the sounds are so complex um you know like how to mix it already is is hard enough and then to put that through a computer to be streamed but i i, I did i did one of my solo stuff and I had to do so much stuff. You had to reroute the sound, all this stuff, just to get Ableton to come through Zoom. And it just wasn't worth it in the end because by the time I then got on the stream, it, like Ben said, it was great because it was there was people from all over Europe on the, on the stream, but my computer just froze out because it couldn't oh, couldn't no. couldn't hack it. So I'd done all that, and then it was just like <laughs> great. I had to turn my video off and it was just a nightmare and from that point I was like I think my set just doesn't work in this context yeah. and 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 that's I'm just gonna accept that and you know I've just changed the focus on doing recordings and make and then put the music out that way because that's how we would usually work anyway. 
Yeah, I, I would say that you, you um, if you're trying to do it all yourself, it, it is very difficult uh, to get all the levels right, etc., and the technology of it all, and whether you've got the equipment to actually put it forward. Uh, I mean, I can cite some examples of some very successful amateur uh, streaming and one of those I thought was very successful was the one that Jason Rebello did with Ian Bellamy. It was the first of several and um, what he did, he got his children to uh, do the, uh, the te technical side of aspect of the, of the uh, broadcast. So it left him free to play uh, for he, him and Ian to have some jokes between them and it was so delightful. The whole thing was uh, very good and I think they started to forget about the uh, the technical aspects, they, be, they became themselves. We found here at the concert house in Dortmund and also talking to other concert houses in Europe was because we have the resources in order to very professionally uh, get TV crews in, live streams and all that sort of stuff. Um, and at first it was great and we kind of had this back catalogue of the last how many years of live recordings and we were seeing good audiences at first but then the kind of novelty wears off and it's not the same. And the sound, while good, is not the same as being sort of live in front of an all in front of an orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, so quite quickly, um, we kind of uh, abandoned it, really. We still do occasional things, but because the audience desire was to come back in live and do it in the concert house, in whatever way we could do that and we've done it i mean we have to shut down again on monday completely but we've been running stuff in some form for as long as we can even if that meant 200 people in a 1500 seater house um and the other big problem was monetization is actually paying for all this you know that regardless you could have a stream that's got massive amounts of views and massive reach but i don't think we saw any i'd have to check but i don't think we saw any that came anywhere close to what we would take um, mm. during a concert you know one is we've been doing donations which um you know it's free to view but there are donations that's still holding its own it adds it's an added revenue to the the band uh, as well as helping uh, support the club so we pay them a fee and then we have the um, thing on top. So I, I'm 100% in favour of pay to view because I think that mm. gives value to the music. And I've always, yeah. uh, throughout my promoting career, that's been uh, paramount that people actually, you know, invest in the performance by actually paying for it. So I think uh, we've got to move more, uh, more firmly in that direction. Jamie, I wanted to ask, you, you're in a 12-piece band. Have you been able to do anything sort of over this time um with regards to streaming um well it's only 11. phew um <laughs> <laughs> although if it was if it was 12 i guess we at one point we could have done two different rules of six and just like shouted at one another um <laughs> no is the answer so uh I think a lot of what everyone said is true. I don't think that it's any more true as a result of the live streaming than it is as a result of like live gigging. I think, or or, sh or shooting a video that isn't going to be live streamed. That's just going to be a promo video you're putting together mm -hmm. to release in three months' time. I think it's still a matter of resource. And if you're at that early stage, you're not going to command the fee, and you're not going to have you know three camera operators and a live sound engineer and everyone's amazing headphone mixes and, and most of what I do is pretty DIY and we try and do it as best as we can and I, I don't see the live stream element is just like one more obstacle but I don't think it's it's um, it's any different than it would be for an artist with like a label and a 10 grand PR budget trying to do something versus like taupe or whatever or, you know um, it, it the same suck it and see sort of thing has to has to apply with that with, with the Ag Becker thing yeah it's basically on hold apart from this outreach sort of project that we've been lucky to be able to do um but e like even getting in a room to try and record something for a live stream would be really difficult to do in terms of covid safety mm. um we had to cancel like uh 
eight out of our 10 day album tour in March yeah. and doing like a, a live stream gig shouting about it as loudly as possible on Facebook. I think at this stage it's too late because as we were saying people the novelty of that's kind of worn off mm. but also like from a holistic sense I, I'm bored of just trying to spend my life shouting as loudly as possible on things owned by Mark Zuckerberg and I want to get in a room and feel yeah. people and see them and interact with them and the joy of a lot of the, the bands that we're all in I'm sure and with the community music mm. side of things is like the immediate palpability that's why we all do it it's why we get on the train it's why we pay slightly too much for a pint of something and you know like <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um, thank you, Ben, Gaunt, Laura Jones, Paul Pace, Jamie Stockbridge, and Matt Robinson. And we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Okay, bye! bye. 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 We'll be posting more of that session on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and give us a like if you are in the mood. We would much appreciate the support. What's next, John? We're going to hear from Helena Summerfield, who is project leader for Jazz North's Jazz Camp for Girls program. Uh, she's catching up with fellow tutor Ben Helm from Newcastle's Jazz Co-op's Making Music Together program. Uh, but before that, she's going to tell us how Trafford Music Services Jazz Ensemble have responded to lockdown. It's certainly been the strangest start to a new school year that I've ever experienced. But at Trafford, we've continued to push our jazz provision by moving our jazz collective rehearsals, that's our youth jazz band rehearsals online, and arranging live stream performances by our staff jazz band called Ain't Misbehaving. The Jazz Collective have created two remote recordings during lockdown, mixed and edited by James, our talented guitarist. <laughs> Tutor Ben Helm is the Music and Arts Learning Coordinator of Making Music Together. This community music making project was set up in 2018 by the Jazz Co-op in Newcastle to provide opportunities for people to learn, play and listen to music together. I asked Ben about taking the decision to move his rehearsals online. If you play an instrument, if you don't play an instrument, um, if you just want something nice to watch on a Tuesday evening. We welcome anybody who's age 16 and older. We did have before all of COVID hit, we were, we were in eight different um, community venues around around uh, the Northeast with everything that's going on. We're running this one session um, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. on Zoom. You don't have to have had any previous experience in the instrument at all. If you live in the northeast area and you need an instrument, we can come and drop an instrument off with you. We have a bank of instruments that were donated uh, to us and we've got through instrument sponsors so we can give you an instrument. And if you want to pursue uh, the sessions or, or pursue learning an instrument, whether it's with us or somebody else, you, you can keep that instrument for life, which is yours as well. Um, yeah. I think it is definitely, I think you're doing a fantastic job there. Um, sounds such a positive project to be involved with. Great to hear from these educators. Totally. But how about some music now? All right. Let's drop in again with Ben Howling. He's about to tell us about some of the vinyl he's been digging during the lockdown and show us some gems from his rather impressive collection. Let's hear it. So first up, this is Protein Threat by OCs. Uh, if you don't know them, they're a great American rock and roll band um, based in California and San Francisco. 
Uh, they've been going since the late 90s, I think, under the leadership of a guy called John Dwyer, who writes all the songs, plays guitar, and sings and plays synthesizer. They've also got, in the current lineup, a bass player and two drummers, and they are one of the best live bands I've ever seen in my life. I've seen them so many times. They've got this ridiculous output, which is almost impossible to keep up with. They just release album after album after album, like several a year. And the last few have either been kind of heavy Sabbath influenced, quite doomy things, or some kind of ambient synth music. And this one instead is really influenced by kind of post-punk and new wave and pop. And they've added that into their usual mix of kind of psychedelia and punk. Uh, it's really energetic and kind of tall and sinewy compared to the kind of sprawling riffy tunes they've been doing recently. It's super cool, you should check it out. I'm a little bit up, I'm a little bit down, I'm a little bit concerned since you're laying on the ground. I'm a little bit high. I've also been really enjoying this uh, Nico Peel session, which was released on Gearbox this year. So that's Nico. Um, Nico from the Velvet Underground, accompanying herself just on a harmonium in Manchester in 1971. Uh, the songs are really melancholy and she sounds very kind of sparse and exposed and raw. Um, yeah, it's really something. It's Make sure you're feeling emotionally robust first because uh, it's quite harrowing. So I've really been digging Sarati Korwa's um, new EP on the Leaf label. It's called Other Land. Um, so he's a percussionist, drummer, and band leader based in London. Uh, he's got an amazing team of musicians here. Like the, all my favourite people from the UK jazz scene. He's got Ruth Goller on bass, Kush Gaia from Moti Self Down, um, Tamar Osborne from Collar Kuta, Chris Williams from Lead Beer really great band, working with some different MCs and poets. If you want to check out any of um, the music I've released on Bandcamp during lockdown. Uh, the new World Service Project album came out last month on uh, Rare Noise Records. It's called Hiding in Plain Sight. And there, there was a new, uh, there was a new Wandering Monster EP that came out on Ubuntu Music uh, also last month. That's a two-track EP featuring the tracks Metropolis and Division. As well as that. Uh, my band Viper Time released a four-track live EP in aid of a, an amazing charity called Solidaritech and we recorded that at a festival called Smugglers Festival last August. <laughs> really has some great stuff on the shelves. We're always looking for recommendations of music to check out, so if you've been enjoying some new discoveries or old favourites, jump in in the comments and let us know. Yes, and we're still adding music to our Spotify playlist, so follow that and stay up to date with what we've been listening to. Now though, we're going to find out about some music which is completely brand new. North East drummer and band leader Abby Finn has just released her debut album, Northern Perspective, with her trio. Uh, she sat down with us and we grabbed a bit of time to talk about the experience of recording and releasing brand new music in these uncertain times. Here's what she had to say. from um, Newton Aircliffe in County Durham, quite a small town. Um, so when I was 10, I started drum lessons with Durham Music Service. 
Um, and then I went on to play jazz with the um, big band, so their county county youth big band. And from that moment onwards, I really, really enjoyed jazz music because I'd been doing sort of classical things, orchestral, you know, choirs, all, all that stuff, brass bands, but jazz really spoke to me. Um, I just found it quite exciting. Um, the fact that a lot of it wasn't very regimented, you know, in the sense that it's very improvised, and I really, I really enjoyed the sort of the challenge of playing that, even in big band when it is quite structured. It still seemed like very open compared to other things. Um, so then after that, after I decided I'm going to do jazz, um, I went and studied jazz at Leeds College of Music, um, and I was lucky to study with Sebastian de Cromna, who was just amazing, along with loads of other great tutors. Um, so yeah, I did so much jazz there. <laughs> um, and then I studied a master's at Trinity Le Ban in London. Um, and then I did a, a short uh, West End stint as well um, at the Pinter Theatre. That was a, a show called Night School. That was, that was really cool because um, they wanted to interject a live jazz drummer onto that. So that was, that was really fun. It was really strange actually, it was great though. Um, and then I moved, so I did quite a lot of moving around. <laughs> and then I moved back up um, to the northeast. I did a little bit of time in Newcastle, but now I'm more County Durham based. But Newcastle County Durham is kind of where, where I'm at at the moment. Um, and I'm just doing sort of my own jazz stuff around that area at the moment. Um, it's called Northern Perspective, so it's myself on drums, I've got Harry Keeble on the tenor saxophone, I actually met Harry um, at Leeds College of Music, and I've got Paul Granger on the double bass. So when I first started doing a bit of jazz around Newcastle, Paul um, was kind enough to ask me up at the jam, in, on, uh, yeah, I was still on Pink Lane at that time, and he was just really, really welcoming, and I just, I just loved the atmosphere, and me and Paul get on really well, like, I always say, in a band, if the bass player and drummer don't like connect, it's, it's not good. So I really, yeah. really connect with Paul, and I love it. Um, and Harry's just like you know that fab layer on top is is amazing. So that that's um, my trio at the moment. Um, and the idea behind the album, because me and Harry have received. I mean, obviously I'm from the north, but in terms of like jazz, meeting all the jazz musicians and audiences. We've just received such a warm welcome in Newcastle and the Northeast in general, um, and where we've been playing our music for the last few years. You know, the audience members are fantastic and really supportive, and so are the other musicians. Everyone, everyone really wants to get involved, helping each other and, and playing together. And Northern Perspective's kind of like a thanks to the people of, of the North, really, and also to show um, the rest of the UK that you know, the, there's more jazz going on in areas just outside of London, because obviously there's great jazz going on in London, but we want to show um, that there's jazz going on in different areas as well. So it's kind of just like a little little showcase of what um, some of the Northeast musicians are offering at the moment. Because um, obviously there's people like yourselves and Zoe and so many of the people are doing great things. postponing the recording session I don't think there were any huge difficulties um, in actually getting it recorded obviously we postponed like quite a few months which it wasn't great you know I was a bit upset because we thought we were going to get this out in a couple of months time um, so obviously there's quite a big delay on that but the, the actual recording was fine there was only three of us who were able to distance really well in this huge room we're all in the same room together obviously Adam was in in the, uh, the control room, so that was all fine. Uh, we managed to get all the, the CDs done, which was fine. Um, and then, yeah, so trying to release it. I mean, it is released now, um, so it's available on Bandcamp um, and at any of our gigs as well, which should they be on now because we're in lockdown. <laughs> we do have an online streamed gig at the Globe coming up actually on the 22nd. Um, but yeah, I mean, we got the CDs. We we had a, a gig the other week at the Prohibition Bar, so we got to got to sell our CDs there. Um, we can sell them online on Bandcamp, which is great. So you can still sort of buy the albums and the digital downloads. It's just we we kind of hoped when we first um, said we were gonna record the album that we might be able to line up quite a few gigs, you know. And we we did have quite a few gigs and festivals lined up for this year, and we thought, oh, we'll we'll be able to sell them there, which is it is quite a big blow because. We would like to bring this music to audiences further afield, you know, so everyone can 
hear us and see what we've made for them really um which so yeah i suppose it's just kind of a waiting game with the whole covid thing um for us to be able to actually do live gigs and present these cds and things <laughs> fascinating stuff check out the links in the description below to hear abby's music and we'll be hearing more about the challenges of releasing music next month from manchester's own graham south so remember to subscribe to our channel and um you'll be hearing more from us in the future i'm looking forward to checking that out but uh can we time yes please okay then Let's take a visit to Meg's, Meg's musical tool shed. <laughs> Who's in the shed with you this time, Megan? We have the brilliant Chris Sharkey, um, who joined me for a chat about guitar, bass, and music production. Awesome. Let's have a look at that now. What piece of equipment makes you most excited right now? <clears throat> um, hmm. Okay, well, it, it's a funny one that because like like as I was saying before about this, my kind of like everything is just everything is just a tool to me, you know, uh, in order to get something done, and and as you can probably tell by me talking about some of the things that I've done this year is that like each each kind of um, context and each band requires different tools, yeah, um, and you know, and and if I'm improvising with people, um, I'll think about what I might want to like the kind of sounds that I want to ha have available for that particular group of people. And I will put things together based on that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and that process of like, uh, you know, it's a drummer, you know, depending on the gig, a drummer will bring different drums, you know, or they might tune the drums differently or they'll certainly bring different types of cymbals and a, a variety of sticks and mallets. And I, you know, uh, saxophone players have, are the same are about mouthpieces and, mm -hmm. and reeds and things like that. So I see it as being the same kind of thing where you choose the, the right tools that, that you think are going to... Well, for me, like working with improvisers, like I just want to have sounds available that like if I trigger them or bring them in, it's going to like, it's going to ignite excitement among the people I'm playing with yeah. to create, to make things happen. I'm I'm not even really thinking about like, making the guitar sound a certain way. It's just, it's really more about the, the reaction other people are going to have to the, to it when it happens. So I'm quite into these dramatic, uh, dramatic sounding things. Mm. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So, but like, just to talk, I mean, just to, the, the other thing I'm slightly wary of, is, and, and, I, and you know, I don't want to be a buzzkill or anything, but like um, the kind of, there's a, I think there's a, the, the the sort of the the a lot of the chat around equipment mm -hmm. and stuff can can be can be can become quite can get quite close to a very kind of consumerist kind of thing yeah uh, and on youtube yeah. at the in the minute it seems like it's a chunk it's a tough one you know because like there's not a lot of money in the music industry anymore and, and the way a lot of artists are, i think are getting paid is by essentially doing uh, working for gear companies and, and showcasing gear and like the boom in the boutique pedal market and things like that are, are really exacerbated by this kind of like this this um, this fetishistic almost kind of like uh, um, attitude towards yeah. equipment Definitely. and and I, and, I, and I think we have, we have to be careful about that because it can it, if you, it kind of you know what they say they don't say this in you know kind of explicitly but like essentially that you know there's a there's a danger of oh if you get this you're going to be the player that you want to be yeah. you know like yeah. and, and it's it kind of like and of course that's not true and yeah, like and, and if and, 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 you see on yeah. youtube how to sound like steve vai yeah. and it's it's a collection of pedals or something like that yeah. um, and you know yeah, exactly and and of course it's not even objective because because they're being paid by that pedal company to do the demo. And, and, and so uh, it's a funny time because like, I, I think you can get, it's, you know, as a young player coming up, you can get caught up in that, in that thing. Yeah. Um, and I did, I think, I think, I think as a younger player myself, I got, I got caught up in that mm -hmm. thinking that if, 
thinking that if I got this or I got that, it would solve the problems that I thought I had with my own plan. Yeah. And, and really what I wish, what I really, really wish um, I had known back then were some, just some fundamental things um, about the way a guitar, a certain guitar interacts with a certain kind of amplifier yeah. and you know, in order to create a certain kind of sound and, you know, the way, you know, like knowing, knowing the difference between a Fender style amplifier and a Marshall style amplifier and what that's going to do in terms of your, the way you play mm -hmm. is more important than, you know, um, what pedals you have. Like understanding the way that fundamental relationship works and, to, and, and the sound that it can give you mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is really the important thing rather than kind of thinking, oh, if I get this and this and this and this, it's going to end up like that. Yeah. You know, like under really understanding what's happening with certain types of distortion or saturation, what's happening in the signal chain and what's, what's happening to your notes as they're being played, yeah. understanding that and the effect that these things have on will, will, make, will make you make better choices in terms of the stuff that you have. Yeah. And I didn't, I, it took me ages to figure that out, really. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it took me ages. To, I played Fender amps forever and was unhappy, really, and, and, and didn't realize that I, the sound I was looking for was, was an amplifier more built like a Marshall, where you're going to have, um, it's going to essentially distort and compress your sound on the way in and give you a bigger sound and all of that. I just didn't know a lot of that for ages. And, 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 tr and without... Um, and without that information, I just kind of went around in circles with pedals trying to solve that problem. And, yeah. you know, uh, what's great now is that if you're, if you're interested in that stuff, you can go online and find out really quickly, you know, the, yeah. you know, the difference between these things and listen to them and, you know, things like that. And I think that's a really great thing. I'm, I don't want to be a total downer about what's happening on YouTube with gear. I, th I think you can learn so much. It's fantastic. And young players now are much more savvy, I think, than I was because, the, you know, like when I was coming up, the only way you could really hear something would, would, would be to go to the shop and, and, and try it, you know, and before you start delving into, before you start delving into buying this stuff left, right and center is a really good thing to do. And what I say to my, to my students is um, the other, most people have laptops these days and something like GarageBand or Logic or whatever. And yeah. there's some really great virtual um, amps and pedals and things and what's yeah. you know they don't sound they don't sound exactly like they're a real thing but they're they're getting better and better and they sound closer and closer and a really good thing to try out is is just trying different combinations of virtual instruments and yeah. and if you like the green pedal next to the black pedal in front of the gray amplifier then you can think okay well maybe i need to find those things in real life and see how they are and and i think that's really good too you know like to, to do that experimenting find out what you it's really easy now to find out what your favorite players play you know but like um you know but understanding the way that equipment works and what's doing what will will you know get you closer to rather than just getting everything and thinking you're yeah. going to immediately have that sound it's like yeah. you know there's a bit more to it than that I, i'm not i'm really trying not to avoid your question i'm going to give you a definitive <laughs> definitive answer <laughs> being a musician uh, who also records and mixes um, the, th the thing that I'm the most excited about at the minute is the, uh, is my, uh, recording interface that I'm, that I'm actually talking to you on now. Right. So I have an, eight, I have an eight channel, uh, recording interface, um, made by universal audio and, and it allows me to record, um, uh, uh, in my home or anywhere, anywhere I want to go, mm -hmm. um, up to 16 channels, uh, okay. of music. And I can the really the thing that's really great about it is is that you can you can um, use virtual um, plugins as you record live. So oh. what that means is what that means is that you can you can basically make this digit this this kind of like ultra modern pristine digital bit of equipment here sound like sound very close to the sound of vintage Neve desks API desks okay. EQs things like that and. For me, that's super exciting because I can track in real time and be creative at the capture stage of yeah. recording, which is something I've never been able to do before because I don't, I have a bit of a rule around um, recording. It, I'm like 100% digital. I don't own any um, outboard analog equipment or anything like that. I have a rule about that because it's just, a, it's, a, it's like a bottomless pit of uh, stuff you're going to need and then 
that leads to another thing and I, I see it happen and I just I made a decision a while back that I'm just going to be 100% digital and just do everything in the box and uh, and this really helps this means that if I I did a recording here a few weeks ago with uh, Emil Carlson and Michael Barden based the double bass oh, okay. in the next room uh, drums in here and me in here plugged straight in and I recorded uh, the, I recorded everyone the way that you would if you were in a recording studio, i.e. compressing the signal and EQing the signal on the way in and making decisions about the sounds of the instruments before we played. Mm -hmm. And it, it, we all had separate monitor mixes and it, it just sounded amazing in the headphones and we played great and it was just so enjoyable. And and then when, of course, when when we were done and I listened, we listened to it back, Pulling, pulling, pushing up the faders and logic and listening back, it was it just sounded fantastic straight away. So normally, you, you know, you, for me, I do all of that stuff afterwards, but it's yeah. so it's so much more fun doing it when you're actually there. And yeah. so I'm like, and and you know, to make this back to to pull this back to guitar, what I did is I had a, I had a little pedal board down here that I was playing through, and then I went straight into the interface and used a virtual amplifier. That um, that I think just sounded absolutely fantastic, and that so I'm I'm very excited, and that amplifier because I am I am going to mention some actual equipment and their names. So the amplifier I was using was a Friedman uh, 100 watt head virtual amp. Friedman is that was the name, and that's uh, so yeah. So really, that's a shout out to Universal Audio because that you know they are kind of like using a lot of their stuff. Now at the uh, now at the recording stage, but also when it gets to mix stage, I'm I'm using a lot of their things because I think, yeah, turning stuff that's kind of quite cleanly digitally recorded into things with into kind of like harmonically rich, satisfying sounds, I, I'm using a lot of their stuff, including their amp models, which I think, I think they do just sound fantastic, and mm -hmm. it's a really exciting time for for digital audio. I think the the quality now is just is. Yeah, it's quite a, quite absurd <laughs> how good yeah. how good things sound. So you know that's kind of that's the one thing I'm um, I'm kind of digging uh, on the production side. Um, I'm so excited about that. And then uh, shall I? What about guitar stuff? Shall I be shall I be a bit more? So should we? Shall I? Shall I pull up an actual pedal? You can. Yeah. You don't don't worry too much yeah. about it. It, all this. This conversation is amazing because it's so helpful. And it's oh, good. equipment is all about what we want to talk about. So, um, yeah, yeah. Don't worry too much about it being about um, or whatnot. But if you have something you want okay. to show, then absolutely, we'd love to. Well, yeah. I mean, I've got so the pedal board I've got down there. I, I I've uh, I put together because I'm, I was when when this thing's finally over, I'm going to be doing some live shows with um, with Anton Eager who's the drummer from Phronesis. And he, he put out a record um, last year on edition that's fantastic. Everyone should check that out, called AE. Um, right. And uh, yeah, I, I was supposed to be on tour with him this autumn and over the summer, but of course that hasn't happened. So what I've been learning his music and um, and I put a pedal board together to, to try and, because I didn't play on the album, but I'm, so I put something together that I think approximates the sounds that are on there, because I want to be able to do that and then also, and then add my own thing to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I suppose like, yeah, what, what's really important for that band. So again, coming back to tools. So it's a very, it's a very, very produced sound, that record. So, uh, and everything is, everything is very, um, it's just, it's a great sounding album, uh, very, very nicely produced. And, and, but you know, like most things that you've ever heard on a record, all, all the sounds on the album are, well, in fact, any sound, any record you've ever heard, every single sound that's on there has been compressed in some way. So there's this word that gets used a lot, compress, compression. It's a thing that audio engineers kind of obsess about, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's an important uh, thing it's, compression is quite an important thing to have when you try to when you're trying to go after certain sounds, and I think for this music, uh, it was important for me to have um, a, 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 a compressor that was going to um, give me a very smooth, um, clear sound for for certain things. The thing is about the guitar is is that it, there's a lot of attack sometimes, and then a lot of sustain. Uh, so you get these big peaks, and then very very quiet in the middle. Uh, uh, following the peaks and what a compressor will do it will just it will reduce those peaks a little bit and and, and 
as a result of that in increase the volume of the quieter stuff. And what that means is that your, your guitar sound actually kind of sounds like what guitars sound like on a record, you know? Amplifiers will also compress things, um, it, but they kind of do it in a different way. So, so uh, yeah, I've got a, comp a compressor pedal down there that's, that's really, that I think is very, very important for, um, uh, uh, for doing the job, you know, like without it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna sound quite as, I don't know, polished, quite as correct, quite as like the record as, as it would without it. So for that, but the thing is that like, I wouldn't use that pedal on a Roller Trio gig and I probably wouldn't use that pedal on an improvised gig, you yeah. know, but for this particular thing, it's, um, it's, it's, it's exactly what's, what's needed. But you know, it, it's probably, it's a pedal, and compression as a as a um, as an effect is probably one of the most complex to understand. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of um, it's a tricky one, um, yeah, to get your head around. But when used, when you know, and I, I encourage everyone to go out and learn about it and what and learn about what the the terms are um, with in compression, like threshold and ratio and attack and release. It it all sounds very complicated, but when used correctly, it can really make the difference between. Uh, you know, something sounding okay and something sounding great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my comp uh, my I'll just I'm just gonna say my compressor pedal. That's what I'm excited about. And then <laughs> because you can you can get, it doesn't matter which one I've got. You, you know, you can there's, there's lots and lots of different ones, and you can you know uh, it's one of those things where you know you could probably go out and experiment with you know do it inside your computer, um, and you know you might find that you get some really interesting results from from it. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for talking to me about your all of your stuff that you've got going on and your equipment. It's been really, really helpful and really interesting as well. Glad to hear it. Excellent. Uh, so I hope you have a lovely weekend. <laughs> Look after yourself and hopefully we'll be out gigging and we'll maybe play the same gig again soon. I hope so. Yeah, that'll be lovely. All right. I will see you very soon. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Wow, that was really interesting. Yeah, Chris is such an inspiration. And there's more coming next month with Craig Scott in the tool shed. Brilliant. Uh, next month, we'll also be hearing from Hakarit Bopari from York telling us about the Music Venues Trust and the amazing work that they've been doing. We'll be hearing from musicians, including Graham South, about new music that's coming out. And we have the first in a brand new series of videos from the incredible Mike Walker, who's going to be talking about how he connects with music in performance, along with a whole load of other tips for musicians. So definitely check that out. We'll also be dropping in for a discussion panel about jazz in education with some fascinating names. And we'll be bringing you a feature on jazz radio and podcast coming out of the Northern Sea. Awesome. Don't forget to like our channel, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. And if you have anything that you think we should be talking about, we want to hear you. Remember to email us at news at jazznorth.org. Great, now back to Bella Horbar, who is going to take us into a track from the mighty Sogo Rock. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Bye! Bye! My name is Bella Horvath, and uh, I'm here in Budapest now because I'm making my driving license because it's so important for me to buy a car and easier to go into gigs. This song's title is uh, Your Shelter, and we wrote with the guys in the band because uh, everybody everybody do it uh, their own style in the song, and that's why it's so colorful. Yeah, Le Leeds College of Music, I love this place. They so much help for the band, so much possibility. The, the Chagar Bupin there is... He he helped for the this video uh, because he contacted with the Aston Mike. He was contacted with the Aston Mike, and uh, he sent uh, maybe four or five video from other bands and with the uh, the Sober Rock as well. And they choose this band 
we want to play in festivals or jazz clubs or anywhere where we can because we so burning we want to play